This begins a, a series called the CORE, the Agape Home Fellowship CORE. And what this is going to be is a group of core messages that we will tape and we'll put on uh, our homepage and they'll be for future churches to use as they launch. Um, and the title of this one is, as we look, it's the uh, New Testament Church. And we're going to talk about the Agape Home Fellowship vision. Every, every corporation, every church... Uh, they develop uh, mission statements and vision statements. And so tonight what I'm going to talk about is the vision of agape. And it's uh, to be in the New Testament church. And I'm hoping that all of you put this in your brain. Because the vision of agape is to be unified in his love while changing our communities. This is what we want to do as a church. Not only this house fellowship. This is the beginning. The vision here is to multiply. And they became two, and then four, and then eight, and grow, and grow. And, and to change our communities through that. And so the scripture that we're going to use tonight is Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Here's another translation. This is out of Young's literal, tra literal translation. Without a vision <coughs> is a people made naked. And whoso <coughs> is keeping the law... Oh, he is happy. The contemporary English version says, without guidance from God's law and order disappear. With, excuse me, without guidance from God, law and order disappear. But God blesses everyone who obeys the law. And I think we see this today. If we look at our society, it looks like left and right people are casting off restraint. They cast off restraint in how they act towards each other. They cast off restraint in how they dress. They cast off restraint in restraint and how they talk uh, the older among us yeah the older among us could t and even us okay I'm, I'm speaking mostly to young people we can tell you that things used to not be said and done in public it didn't mean that people didn't do them but there was a restraint but today it seems like anything goes we want to be unified in His love. That's the first part of the vision, is to be unified in His love. And this is John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give you. See, it's a new thing. It was a new thing. The church was a new thing that Jesus was doing. See, this love one another, that, was, that wasn't that was seen before. It, he says, I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. That is a high bar. To love each other as Jesus has loved us. That is an impossible bar. But yet we are not supposed to say it's impossible. We're supposed to strive for it. He says, by this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, church disunity, church disharmony is nothing new. Many of us have come from traditional church and we see that there was conflict in there. We can, we can name people we had conflicts with or conflicts that were going on. Let me read... Uh, out of the book of Philippians, chapter 4. I love this because this is not a 21st century issue. Paul, back in about 60 AD, says, I beg, Euodia and I beg Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. See, these, were late, these ladies were Christians. Euodia and Syntyche were Christian ladies. They had worked tirelessly by Paul. Side by side with him and labored. But yet they had a conflict. Conflicts are going to happen. We're going to have conflicts. As I told some last week and the week before when we had our, our, our pre-launch, I told them, I am going to disappoint you. I am going to not call you when you think I need to call you. I am not going to care for you the way you think it. sometimes I need to care for you. Disappointments are going to be made by you and by me. You're going to disappoint me. I entreat you to agree in the Lord, is what the Apostle Paul says. See, we have to remember that agape, selfless love, we are a family. We are a family of God. We are all part of the family of God. We, we I remember singing that as a kid. And and what it means really is that we have an eternal relationship. 
Javier, 2,755,345 years from now, me and you are still going to be walking the streets of glory together. Y'all get that? Mm -hmm. It never ends. While changing our communities. <coughs> Acts 17.6 tells a very interesting story and gives a real good insight to what the early church was like. See, they were looking for these guys. And when they could not find them, they dragged, they, they, they found the one person they could find, and that was Jason. And some of the other brothers that were before the city authorities, they pulled them before the city authorities, and they started shouting, these are the men who have turned the world upside down. The early church made a difference in the community. They, they, see, these guys that were screaming, they had been making the idols. The little silver idols. That's what their job was. When, when the apostles came through and they preached Jesus Christ, these people turned from their idols. Now all of a sudden, these guys are out of a job. Instead of making 100000 a year, they're now making 20000 a year. And today it turned their world upside down because the early church made a difference in the community. It made a difference. Uh, we want to be a church at Agape that makes a difference. Here's a question that everybody should ask. You should ask it of yourself regularly. Every church should ask regularly. The churches that are on every corner in this town and in this county and in this state should ask this question. If this church were to disappear off the street corner tomorrow, if we were to disappear out of the neighborhood, would anybody other than us notice the difference? See, the church that is the New Testament church that is doing things for God, when they disappear, the community feels the difference. See, the community is changed by the church. So a New Testament church, see, when we fulfill the vision to be unified and to change our communities, we become what is known as that New Testament church. And that New Testament church is a church that prays together. They started off praying together. Before they had done anything, they prayed. Acts 1.14. These things, with one accord, these were devoting themselves to prayer devoting themselves. It wasn't a pastime. It wasn't a hobby. It wasn't something they did when they had some free time. They devoted themselves to prayer. And they devoted themselves to each other. You'd be amazed what happens to your relationship with other people when you pray with them. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. See, the church today is weak because it's prayerless. The pulpits are prayerless. I can tell you as a pastor that I have spent numerous hours preparing sermons and not many hours praying for them. And that's wrong. We read over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture that they prayed. They prayed. And prayer is a discipline. Don't, don't think it comes easy. It does not come easy. And don't think that the devil will not distract you from your prayer time. You will set your heart on prayer, and then all of a sudden, you remember one other thing you've got to do before you can go pray. Yeah. And that one other thing turns into something else and something else, and before you know it, the Spirit has left. The Spirit of promptness has said, okay, get to me, I guess, when you've got a chance. I testify to you that that has happened to me. The Lord has taught me that lesson over and over and over and over and over again. It happened today. The church prayed. It was a church of changed lives, Linda. It was a church of changed lives. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The church should be made up of people who live holy lives, and they are different. They are different than the people that they go to school with. They're different than the people that they work with. They're different than the people that they sit next to. You're different. You're not to be the same. You're called to be holy for he is holy. You're called to be different. There is unfortunately not a whole lot of difference between many of us and the people on this street who do not even claim the name of Christ. They don't even say out of casually I'm a Christian. They say, ah, I don't believe all that. One of the best men that I ever knew, one of the 
what I would consider the absolute perfect Christian example was not it well he was an atheist he was better than 99% of the Christians I had ever met including myself he never lied he wasn't deceitful he was giving to the point of hurting but he didn't believe in God there should be a difference the church that was the New Testament church is a church of the supernatural and awe came upon every soul many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles see the church is supposed to be a, a place where supernatural things happen it, it's not a place where the, the, the ordinary happens the New Testament church is supposed to be a place where supernatural things happen things you cannot explain see all came upon every soul in Acts chapter 2, we see that they spoke in tongues. That was supernatural. In Acts chapter 3, we see supernatural healing. Over and over and over again, we see supernatural healing. We see people raised from the dead. But you need to know that nothing is more important than the supernatural work that Jesus Christ does on you. It is a supernatural thing when He saves you. When, when you become a follower of Christ and, and you become heaven bound instead of hell bound like you belong, you belong in hell. When you become heaven bound, that is a supernatural miracle. Never forget it. That is the biggest miracle that happens in our lives is the fact that we will be with him someday. I, I was reading this today and, and, and I decided to put it on here. Uh, some are arrogant as though I, I were not coming to you. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. He said, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not uh, I, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Remember that. God's kingdom does not consist in a in a crafty sermon. There are many people out there that can put a great sermon together and leave you mesmerized and you love to listen to them on the radio but and and maybe God's power is behind that but you need to understand that the king, the kingdom of God does not come from words that's what Paul says there ain't enough words you're going to be able to put together to move the kingdom of God the kingdom of God only moves through power the new testament church is a place where the gospel is preached we need to remember that our job is to preach the gospel. You are a witness. Like, like Sister said earlier, you're a witness. You're a walking, talking, living, breathing witness. And that's the reason why I felt that we needed to get to this. You are a witness for Him. Whether you want to be or not, you can either be a good witness, one that glorifies Him, one that brings glory to His name, or you can be one of those that shame Him by your actions, by your thoughts, by your deeds. You're a witness. The early church, they turned the world upside down. Why? Because the gospel was preached. And, and finally, the early church is a church that shakes the world. The New Testament church shook the world. And in this instance, they literally shook the world. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. There's a couple of things you need to get here. First of all, the primary thing is we will do nothing apart from prayer. And I don't mean that we're going to pray. I mean that we can't do anything apart from prayer. You want to know why maybe you've been ineffective in your life? You want to know why maybe a church that you're thinking of is ineffective? Pastor, if you want to know why you've been ineffective in the ministry, they prayed. The world will not shake on its own. But by the power of the prayer of the people, when they're in one accord, we can't shake the world. They literally shook the world. And you also need to know that what prayer does is it strengthens you. It, it, it emboldens you to speak the Word of God with boldness. If you are timid in speaking the Word of God, to your classmates, to your co-workers, pray that God will open your mouth. Because see, part of this was they not only shook the world, literally, they shook other people's lives. When they spoke that word of God with boldness, Javi, 
They spoke it. They spoke truth into people's lives. And it literally shook the foundation of their soul. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the cities. They said, these are the men who turned the world upside down. This, as we looked before, see, it only changed their community. They shook that world. They turned those lives upside down because of the power of God. That's what God will do when we pray. So, let's pray. Father, as we enter into this time of discussion, Lord, I ask that you would lead it. Father, just teach us what you would have us say and, and, and just help us to, to speak truth to each other. In Christ's name, amen. amen.